Hey there, Stefano. That is really a lovely score. I like all of the um, the variegated textures, the um, you know all the all of the interweaving commentary and and the colors and yeah, I mean it just you you're really becoming uh, such a great orchestrator and uh, this is a really an excellent example of your you know of what I see as your current progress now there are some things about this that maybe you're not taking into account so we'll talk about that but just before I uh, uh, before I jump into this and um, and sort of take it apart I just want you to know that I have a lot of respect for this score and uh, and I'm, I'm just really happy to receive it from you and everything else. Okay, so <clears throat> having said that, let's get to the nitty-gritty here. So we start off with <clears throat> English horn and uh, lower strings or middle strings. And yeah, I mean, I've, I've mentioned this a few times, even though I also <clears throat> opted to surge in the first bar it's not really necessary because the the accompaniment doesn't really surge right here you've got <clears throat> violas in closing cello right in there and you know I'm not sure how effective that is but I mean it's I guess you're you're saying solo instruments here <clears throat> Yeah, I'm. Yeah, I'm, I mean, I guess it'll work. It's it's not really the strongest um, accompaniment for an English horn, right? Because English horn has a very pronounced sound. Now, that's not to say that it's necessarily the strongest instrument, but it has like a real edge to its. It has it like a very kind of a reedy edge, right? So it could. It's quite possible that the solo strings here will. <clears throat> you know, I mean, if these two people, three people, were playing in a chamber music group together, then they, I'm sure they would balance perfectly because they'd be used to it. But that is something that is going to have to, you know, be taken into account. It's like not without problems, right? It's not, it's, it's like, if this were, um, if, if these were, um, the entire group playing, right? Like all the violas and all the cellos, I would be less concerned. Right, but it's it's just you know it's just kind of more of a possibility <clears throat> that uh, English that the English horn will really play out over the solo uh, strings right in here. Now I really love this right in here. Ba da bum ba da bum ba da bum ba da bum. Ting. That's really nice. Um, I, I I love the role of the. <clears throat> of the solo violin in here. And uh, yeah, I mean I, I see what you're doing here in in sort of pushing things forward dynamically, right? Now, in a concert situation, like like the, like the these dynamics are really there for the um <clears throat> really more for the uh the playback for the mock-up. <clears throat> because, you know, if you were really going to push the solo first violin to fortissimo, <clears throat> this last note is going to be very impassioned, right? It's just going to, it would be, you know, almost wildly out of control. And then, then you're asking the player to play fortissimo on this um you know uh on this artificial harmonic sorry it's really early in the morning it's um <clears throat> a little after 5 and i I've, I've been up since 4:30 or so yeah so and i actually though that's really cool like a way of jumping up two octaves and i think this is something i suggested before right you have you have some instruments playing the F sharp and then I, th I think one of my suggestions was to have like the seconds play the next F sharp up and then to add the artificial harmonic which would jump up a further octave 
um, playing the same note as not the Celesta, but say a um, um, a Glockenspiel uh, written on this pitch. But here you're having the Glockenspiel take the middle uh, the note b between this. Okay, so so the thing about that is that the Glockenspiel will really absorb the sound of the solo violin playing an octave higher than it. So I mean. I mean, if you want that sound, that's great, right? And you've got this thing about pedal F sharps, which we're going to see another one on the next page, which is a kind of a high pedal uh, uh, French horn note. So we'll talk about that when we get there. <clears throat> yeah. Oh, I see that you've got the you got the dynamic over it, pianissimo crescendo to, yeah. Yeah, I mean, like, how, how loud can that really get, right? Right, okay. So, <laughs> I feel that in real life, um, you should try to have homogeneous uh, dynamic markings as much as possible in here. Unless you had, say, horns, in which case I would say if they're part of a, of a soft texture, you would want to balance them out a little bit, right, with different markings. However, um, here, I, I mean, the solo violin probably needs to be marked up a little bit, but, I mean, I don't think you need to go all the way up to fortissimo right here in the middle. If the general dynamic here is mezzo forte, right, I think that going up to forte is probably sufficient. And then um, here, just, you know, maybe piano to mezzo forte is okay, or piano to mezzo piano, right? And, and of course, you like, I, I hope that you've read some of my writings on octave clarinets. A little bit of what you're hearing in the, uh, <clears throat> in the mock-up is is for real and in fact it'll be even more pronounced and that is that octave clarinets have a tendency to reinforce each other in rather you know I mean it, it's a it's a kind of a spicy sound it's a kind of a <clears throat> it's not always the most pleasant sound all right so just be aware of of that okay and then it's like it's really different from say playing you know having piccolo and flute in octaves or having oboe and English horn in octaves, or even having um, clarinet and bass clarinet in octaves, right? The two clarinets in octaves really has like this kind of almost blocky uh, and yet penetrating sound on the ear. Okay, and you know, this is all fine, the, the way that this is scored. Yeah, and then the ting right here at the end. Yeah, I mean, I generally like the idea of what's going on in here, right? So just a just a few things. I, th I think that it sh you should have a general dynamic right in here. Pianissimo crescendo to mezzo forte is great. Okay, just just basically have most of the instruments doing that, right? And then I think you can't go wrong. Uh, and here, you know, ba da 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 dum. And I think ba bum bum. That's perfectly fine with. Um, a single bassoon playing piano. Right? I don't think you need to go to mezzo piano there. Because with the way that this is scored, you make this line more important than the actual melody, right? You know, with a two, a due uh, bassoons, right? It, it It is a kind of a, and it's also, you know, uh, I, I personally wouldn't write a two bassoons um, exposed, you know, an, an exposed part like that above F sharp, right? And here you're going all the, you know, it's B, G sharp, A sharp. Um, it's just not the not the most fortunate sound. So I would say solo, first bassoon, piano, okay? And and it will it will stand out in this texture. It is going to be fine. Everybody will hear it. The uh, harp right in here is okay, okay, and and this is okay, and right here, um, I mean, you could hear it standing out from the, if, if you want a perfectly balanced uh, horn statement right in here, you could mark this pianissimo, 
but you can leave it piano and just just being aware that that you know once again it's it's outplaying the melody here And I really like this. Da, 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 da. Right, that's just the real actual melody in there. And then you throw in your F sharps here. Uh, a bit understated, and that's fine. Yeah, so that's really nicely balanced, Stefano. I really, in, really like that. Now, here we're going to a bit of a <clears throat> misapprehension about the use of slurs in, um, in scoring mezzo staccato. Right? It should be like this. Because mezzo staccato is all about the diaphragm of the player. They're not using their tongue to go tut tut tut, right? They're not, they're going ha ha ha, right? That's mezzo staccato. That's why it has a slur over it because it's all in one breath, correct? So, by putting the piano style, you know, this is like taking this, the slurring that you had in here, uh, crossing all of this, that is like from the piano part, right? Um, by crossing all the way over, you turn this accent in, in also into a, um, into a diaphragmatic accent, right? So it's ha, 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 right? Which is like, it's not the same as ha, 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 ta. Correct, All right? So just really think about dropping piano style slurs into orchestral works. Okay, I, I think I'm going to do a big thing about this, like beginning of the next challenge. I'm going to have uh, release a video talking about um, transcription do's and don'ts. Okay, uh, I like this right in here, the way that you've got the uh, pizzicato here in the double bass, right? But here, I feel... I mean, I, I, I see what you're doing here. You want a contrast between the double bass pizzicato and the harp plucking, correct? Okay. And here you've got your um, your horns, and you first you're matching the trumpets up to the double bass because that's a just a more common sense idea, you'll have a firmer pizzicato pluck, right, with the double basses. But then we're getting to here, and the <clears throat> the uh, the sound of the uh, fourth horn and bass clarinet are combining. And that's really beautiful, by the way. I, I felt that that was one of the strongest parts of the whole arrangement. It just really has this, you know, dropping off. It's it 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 suddenly <clears throat> energizes the music right here in the um, in the in the um, uh, resolution. Sorry, my brain's just a little sleepy this morning. And you are using this to kick off to this this little rip going upwards, right? Okay. <clears throat> and the problem here is that you've got your first horn pushing forte. You've got mezzo forte down here. You've got a fourth horn player that is going to want to match what the bass clarinetist is doing. And you've got the softest instrument in the orchestra playing your bass line down here. So I'm, I don't think that there's any way around it, um, you know, with the way that you've got things like either, you know, you, you, you want a plucked bass line right in here. So, <clears throat> I, I mean, there are a number of things you could do in terms of like maybe having uh, bassoon and contrabassoon play, um, uh, play staccato behind the harp. You could have, and, and then you mark the harp up to forte, right? because otherwise nobody's going to hear it. So just in general, don't, you know, I mean, I mean, here you're trying to balance your harp, right? Because you've got piano here, and then you mark mezzo piano to bring it up a dynamic level. And, and that sort of works in this, um, you know, against all these other instruments. But here, piano bigger than pianissimo here, I don't, and that, but then you got the mezzo forte here, and you got the big rip going up here. So it really does need to be marked up to at least mezzo forte or even even forte 
okay and um, I mean I, I I know what you're I know what you want to do here so maybe maybe doubling with uh, staccato bassoon and contra bassoon isn't a good idea but the thing is, is that you're just adding weight right here at the end so that you can push into the next bar so it, it can't really just you know the whole idea of the contrasting you know the call and response the um, you know sort of mezzo forte and and piano which is really a, that is the right balance there right um, um, to you know to have have loud contrasted by soft right you can't just say well okay well since this is soft well then I'll put the soft bass on this end when you have all this emphasis right so maybe you need to switch these even though it's mezzo forte and the winds here right I don't know so just just that that would be some place where I'd say think about it right consider the options now of course you should be considering the options because it's a question of whether or not you put so much work into something so beautiful and you're going to just like say well that was my challenge uh, it was fun okay now I'm gonna move on to something else because if there if you have a chance to get this performed uh, or send it to a uh, orchestral reading or something like that you should do it right and if you are going to do that then and and my advice makes any sense to you at all then you have an opportunity to tweak the score right so that's that would be all the more reason why we should um, you know that I should work through the score with you and give you suggestions and so on all right now bum 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 here you have interlocking flutes and oboes and they will work to right about here right and then here not so much the first oboe is going to shout over the second flute so if you want the interlocking sound take it to here and then swap right just have the have the um, F natural or F sharp sorry taken over going F, F natural to F sharp here in the in the uh, second flute and then have the first oboe take over the second flutes D right and then and and then the, then these notes here are positioned correctly right so I just think this gets a little too low for your interlocking even if you're thinking well there'll be piano by this point so uh, that shouldn't be a big problem because the musicians can balance well you know considering everything else that's going on you know you got the celesta there you got your trombones and and uh, bass trombone and so on <clears throat> it's it's really important that you finesse that right okay now here you're going diminuendo yeah, and mezzo forte to pianissimo. All right, so so this is kind of a bit of a mess in terms of your dynamics, right? You've got a bunch of dynamic mixing here: triple P in the strings, uh, pianissimo in your bassoons and oboes and flutes, and then yeah, I mean, I mean, I see what you're trying to do. You are trying to eclipse the phrase so that it comes to this very soft. Um, you know, discrete ending at the beginning of the next idea, right? Da, right, and then at that, um, it would be da 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 da. Right? You know, it's uh, or excuse me, it would be da the uh, resolution. Okay, but all right, bear with me. Uh, trombones, mezzo forte to pianissimo. Here's the big problem. Here's your first problem is that these trombones are going to be so much louder and so much firmer than anything going on in your uh, cellos, in bassoons, bass clarinets, <clears throat> okay, uh, second clarinet, that you need to adjust the mix in here, right? If we're thinking of orchestration as a mix now, right? That's not you. That's just me being annoyed at um, you know at, at the the way that uh, you know current thinking imposes itself into um, into older craft. 
Uh, <clears throat> yeah, so I would say here, if you want to get a really good blend, right, then, and you are pushing up to forte here with these instruments, let it be forte, right? Just go all the way up to a forte here in your strings and winds. Leave this at mezzo forte, diminuendo to pianissimo. And don't worry about ending your phrase piano, okay, in all your instruments, all right? Then I think that this will work a whole lot better. But the way that it is now, with these instruments like mezzo forte here to pianissimo, you'll hear a drop off there, right? Because these other instruments are already weaker than the um, than the trombones. So like if they are, if the strings especially are softening down to a pianissimo or a triple P, right? Then then by the time they get here, they are as soft or softer than the trombones, right? So, so, so the trombones are gonna stick out here even though they say pianissimo. And the same thing is true here of your lower winds like your your bassoon right in here right now saying that uh, i really do like the structure here of your harmony like you've got your um you've got your horns contra bassoon on the bottom uh, bass clarinet and then clarinets and english horn right uh, working together and that's really charming okay and a little timpani stroke so that's that's lovely Right, and I mean, I really see what you're trying to do here. You want it all to sort of blend together and come out, so that the um, so that the orchestra is supporting. But that the problem is just right here, right? Is like if you're going to do that, and and also have this kind of kind of raspberry effect, right? You have a lot of raspberries in this. So by raspberry, I mean um, you have all of these portamento slides, right? Um, you know, we've got the We've got it twice in the trombones. Um, we've got this, this sort of sliding down in your strings. And the thing about that is that it it really attracts attention to itself, right? Like more, maybe more than the music is, um, you know, is necessarily going to benefit from. So uh, considering that you, you know, you emphasize downbeats and other beats by pushing up with like with uh, runs you know you go run here so it's it's whenever you do that you might have seen me comment on in other evaluations whenever you do this but yeah it's like you're pointing at the downbeat and saying hey look over there right so the question is how many times can you do that in a modern piece right in a how many times can you do that in a in a piece of modern orchestration where we've heard you know we've heard Tchaikovsky do that you know so many times and and film composers do that and so on and so forth right so how much it's it's it you know comes down to a matter of taste as well so I'm not going to judge your taste against anybody else's but you know just you know just judge how many times you can use that effect right so we got it here um, we've got it here, you know, boah, and you know, we got this, you know, um, da da da, boah, you know, it's just like it's. So we're really, you know, you really are like, I mean, a certain like, and the power of a bass drum, uh, excuse me, a bass trombone glissando in its higher register, it cannot be underestimated right this will really like shout out and this too even more right so just be aware of you know what that does to the music okay um okay so i'm not gonna i'm not going to say don't do this or do do that but just be aware that this will really call attention to itself this kind of s sagging sound and also being aware that it's a lot easier to push up than it is to slide down, right? This is the same with portamento in strings, right? It's it's a lot easier to push up because you can kind of hear the pitch coming a lot easier uh, as you're sliding up than if you're sliding down. There's a much greater risk of the intonation not being the greatest, right? Um, <clears throat> now with 
like a world-class orchestra, that's not a problem. But with a regional orchestra, which is possibly who will read this piece, um, it, you know, who knows, right? That might be great and might not be so great in, with some players, right? Some of the backbenchers. So a backbencher is somebody who has been kind of been with the orchestra forever and they are a solid player and they don't always have enough time to practice because maybe they also have a real estate license. And they're kind of doing the regional stuff as a part-time thing. Um, I mean, it's, it's a... <clears throat> it can be a touchy thing. I you know I once worked for a um for an editor of an online journal uh and I reviewed concerts in my local scene and um I was sent out to review this one um this one regional orchestra that they were um trying out new conductors. And, uh, you know, so I gave a really honest review of what I, what I felt, you know, I felt that the, <clears throat> that the intonation of the, uh, conductor's solo violin playing, he was also a solo violinist, uh, I felt it was just really poor. And, um, I also felt that the strings, you know, I mean, this, obviously the strings really liked this guy, but he wasn't really inspiring them to, to play at their greatest. Well, little did I know that the editor of my online journal was married to one of the cello players from that, or one of the string players from that orchestra. <clears throat> but I didn't, get in, I didn't get into trouble with him, but I'm sure that he got a, an earful from her, right? Uh, so, so, yeah, um... But, I mean, the honest truth was that that regional orchestra was not at the same level as the city orchestra, um, which was world class, right? So, um, you know, in, in that case, I would say that the string section of that orchestra would not, not have not performed this to your liking, and certainly not to the mathematical perfection of the, um, of the mock-up, right? Okay, so I would just say watch out scoring things like that, especially sliding down on strings and on trombones. All right, so now... Um, <clears throat> let's go on to the development. Bum, ba -da -da -da, da -da -da -dum. It's, uh, yeah, I mean, there's so much power just in this one little... Uh, this one little <clears throat> line right in here. So, yeah, I, I'm I'm not really sure what this bracket is achieving. Like, does this bracket have something to do with with um, stopped and then open? And if that's so, shouldn't this be marked as open? And you don't really need the brackets if that is the case, right? Uh, here, if this is open, then you need to mark it like this, right? And then the next time, like, so that, that takes care of these two players. And then the next appearance here of your uh, third and fourth horn, boom. Okay. And now you have sufficiently canceled this. So if these brackets have something to do with with open and closed, oops, I'm trying to select it. Search, it's kind of hard at this, um, at this uh, level of resolution. All right, see, that, that probably works a whole lot better because like you don't really let us know what the bracket is about, right? I mean, what is that bracket about? What is it? You don't have anything of, saying anything uh, related to the bracket. So if the bracket had something to do with being stopped and being open, then um, then this is how you deal with it, right? Not with the bracket. All right, so... Ba -da -da -da. Right, and, and then you have a little drop-off there at the end. That's nice. So... Da -da -da -da. Yeah, okay. Nicely balanced. Okay, however punch right here on the downbeat 
And you got this. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I kind of, I don't know. I don't, okay. Here's another thing too, is you can't do the dynamic in the middle anymore when you have, um, when you have like uh, bracketed or grand staff uh, winds in brass, right? You have to put the dynamics under, right? So this piano to mezzo piano thing, it should be under, right? That was the whole idea of treating this as a grand staff with the dynamics in the middle, meaning both staves. That is like an older, like romantic era, post-romantic era um, publishing convention. Don't do that anymore, okay? Put a dynamic marking under every staff, right? Except for when you're working with like instruments that where one player is playing on a grand staff, then that's different. Okay. Yeah, and, and once again, you've got a you're sliding down. Uh, I, I mean, it'll sort of work, but yeah, this is going to, yeah, I'm not so. I'm just not so sure. I'm not so convinced there. Bum, bum. And now you're going bum 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 bum, and you're saying uh, près de la table. Uh, yeah, I mean, like, if this, if you want this to balance with your, uh, your wins, it would have to be pianissimo diminuendo to, sorry, piano diminuendo to pianissimo versus harp fortissimo, right? That's, that is how you get a balance in there, all right? But I mean, just leave it as is, it's, it's all right. Now, da 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 bum bum, and then this bum, bum. See, once again, you're pointing at that beat. You're going, hey, look at that, right? So that's just a question, like, how much of that can you do, right? All right, so here you've got pizzicato um, double stops. Um, a Bartok pizzicato double stops, okay? And I just want to tell you, it's really not that effective, okay? Now, if you were to do um, Divisi in four and in two right in here, that would be way, way better. But because, but see, what you have to understand is like the Bartok pizzicato grabs the string, pulls it up, and then lets go of it, and it snaps against the fingerboard. Now, imagine doing that with two strings at once, right? What is going to happen is that you're pinching the strings towards each other and pulling them up. And then when you let go, they don't necessarily go straight down. They go to the side, right? And so your snap ends up being a lot weaker. That's the thing. Or, you know, um, there's the possibility that you could maybe do it with three fingers, right? You could have one finger in the middle of the string and then you could have two on either side that would um, sort of pull up and keep things balanced, but then that's just like, how much strength do you think the player has to do that, to pull up two strings, right, at the same time? And then some of these, you know, might be sort of separated apart. Actually, so, you know, all of these could be done with adjacent strings, so that's not a big thing, but like, you know, what if you had, what if you had scored a Bartok pizzicato with strings that were like, you know, your double stop was like, was two strings apart, right? Then that would be even more of a problem. So I would just say divisi and four here. But I mean, you'll still get what you're what you're gonna get. It's just not that strong. Uh, when you get to here, nobody will hear the harp at all, and then barely you're going to hear the Bartok pizzicato in this on the. You know, you'd be better off doing like a, a marcato, uh, marcato. Uh, eighth notes if you really want the quality of these pitches to come through all right but you know but the but hearing the Bartok pizzicato at the end of this big punchy staccato excuse me big punchy accent with the the brass there it you know it'll it'll be very hard for the for the Bartok pizzicato to come through here here sort of although the forte piano 
in your trombones will sort of do, you know, will take away some of that quality from there and from the harp. Um, I think with this, like this little uh, coda sign is more of a damping sign for the harp than it is for the, uh, for the timp excuse me, for percussion. So the best thing for you to do here is to, is to just mark this as an eighth note and then just write damp uh, over the over the eighth rest and then you could just say sim here and then you don't have to ever mark it again for the rest of the piece okay but doing three in a row like this just it just really seems like um, training wheels on a bicycle right you're it's it's over you're you're being too helpful you know it's sort of like assuming that the player can't figure that out for themselves Right, so don't ever do that if you can possibly manage it. Okay. <clears throat> right. And then you have this little push into the resolution. Right. And then this this works really great. See that see right here, right? You've got a really nicely balanced thing. I wouldn't have all the strings go down to pianissimo. Just have everybody be piano here. It's fine. Yeah, so just, you know, try not to do so much dynamic mixing. You know, winds, try to have your winds and strings be the same dynamic as much as you possibly can. Just mix down the, I'm sorry, I shouldn't use that. Balance down the, um, the brass, right? Don't, yeah, don't, um... Yeah, you know, try not to have so many different dynamics because look the you know <clears throat> you know the the big problem with dynamic mixing, right? Here you got an English horn player playing pianissimo crescendo, right? And they're sitting you know not too far away from the from the flutes playing piano. So one of these players might be listening to the other. Right, the flutes might be listening to the English horn player and saying, "Boy, that is a soft piano." They're looking at their part and they're assuming that everybody is playing piano in the wind section, even when they're not. Right, and so they'll say, "Well, I better play softer," which is the opposite of what you want when you've got these brass right in here. Right, so just really try to rethink some of these these uh, textures. Okay, just really try not to have so much mixing and I, I can't remember if we've talked about this before in some of your scores right just like the the impulse to uh, you know to have different uh, dynamic markings in you know across across many different instruments um, I seem to have the impression that there's less in this score than in um, in another score that we might have worked on together but yeah, you have to understand. I've looked at at this point. I've looked at 145 scores, uh, with 146 to come, which will be the final score. And uh, <laughs> yeah, so it's just a, it's a little hazy uh, as to who did what at this point. All right, but uh, this is good. Horns. You know what I would do? I would just have these horns not surge. Okay, just have them be just just be soft and flat. Right, not flat, soft and level, and then just just have the emotional instrument surge, ba da, with your cello, right? Da da, we have a doubling of, um, of oboe, like an octave doubling of oboe and cello here. All right, and then once again, you do that same ba da, ba da, ba da, ba da, right, and so on. Uh. Trading off, right? And you know that's. I mean, that is partially the reason why you are having so many different uh, dynamic markings, right? But it's not really needed. So, so here you're going. You know, you're saying piano in the firsts, right? And you are saying oh mezzo forte in the flutes because you really want the flutes to stand out because they're going down to a like a softer place and they're playing octaves with the English horn and everything else but we just end up with a lot of dynamic mixing in there okay and then then we have clarinets 
mezzo piano crescendo to you know and then you've got this solo viola and you really feel i want that to stand out because it's a softer instrument right and so we're just really getting into a thorn bush of different markings for different situations right now here muted trumpets pianissimo or triple p you know and it behind the piccolo that's great so that's that's totally fine so mute so if you mean that this is going to be a straight mute i think earlier did you say that you wanted a plunger mute right then you, you just have to mark if you're going to do mutes that are not just a standard straight mute then you have to mark every single time you ask for a mute you have to you know you have to tell us um either that it's the same mute that you asked for before or it's the standard straight mute right so that you need to you need to fix this because this will get a raised hand at rehearsal they'll say you want plunger mute again all right all right i mean and it's still it's also not clear you like you ask for a plunger mute and um you don't mention whether or not it's stationary right or whether it's opening or or what right Okay, now we're going to um, this ending part, right? Okay, so this this beautiful this beautiful ending part. Uh, so that's with uh, trumpet and English horn in octaves and muted, and that's very much a Lily Boulanger Debussy um, uh, impressionist period kind of a kind of an approach uh, that's really a lovely idea right and and here you're trying to balance things you're saying um, <clears throat> I want everything to be um, really incredibly soft but then I want this the flutes to be a little bit louder because they're in such a soft you know and it's uh, look look Stefano you are just really adding a lot of work here it's it's something that would work right but it's going to take a lot of you know it's going to take some some work with the conductor and so on right and you might say well i don't mind if they do that work well i don't mind if they do that work either i would be great if they had the time to do that but but you know this kind of a texture is just the assumption that the orchestra has got the money to spend on you know on balancing these things in rehearsal and it, sometimes it just doesn't okay so yeah i mean in print you know in practice this may work right and let's say that you've got a sensitive conductor they'll look at the score and they'll say yeah i you know i, I get what's going on here that's fine um and you may actually have players who just just naturally balance in place and let's hope that that's true okay all right now here i was listening to your um your mock-up and I'm just going to check out here. Right, so um, let me try something else here. All right, so it doesn't look as if you you um, used the um, the harp glissando plugin, and I think we might have I might have mentioned this before, but you might want to use this right uh excuse me not that this harp glissando right so basically you just select the end point of your glissando and then you go to the plugin harp glissando you can get this at sibelius.com you can download it there right and then it just it says like what are the you know what do you want so we've got this so you basically would have to go through this and if you wanted um this tuning then you just would have to rewrite this using the small b uh, the letter b excuse me right this is how you would have to do it right and then uh, don't show tuning I would say show tuning as diagram okay and play the last note you don't need to do that because it's already notated right and then you click this and then 
notice that we have a bunch of uh, MIDI text in there, which is telling uh, invisible text. It's telling the playback how to interpret this, right? And then um, I think this line here, um, Glissando, I would say, uh, yeah, just don't have it not have it not play right okay so that's that's the important thing okay um, yeah so so that way you'll get a much more beautiful um, you know you'll and, and notice the the harp pedal mark shows all of the um, the pedals in the up position telling the harpist just to make sure everything is set flat right Okay, so uh, that way you'll get a more accurate uh, glissando. So now let's move on, right? So your reaction, your um, cascading is pizzicato. Okay, and that's all fine, right? And then we've got uh, violas with atu oboes. Okay, so, so what you're going to get here is you're really going to hear the oboes. And the oboes are going to be kind of going to be a little cold a little bit, or I, they won't be cold, but they'll be, be a little bit sort of hard, a little less emotional, right? Um, I, I almost feel that it would be better to use a single oboe, right? And then maybe have a clarinet doubling the lower voice. And then I think they just this would just come through a lot better. With the way you've got it now is you've got all the weight on the top of the octave, none on the bottom. I'm seeing this a lot. And people are like scoring octaves in the uh, in the strings and then they have the winds just kind of doubling the top line or something or the bottom line and then what you end up is with the the weight of the doubling is on is on the upper or lower note and then it just doesn't really balance very well so I would say um, or maybe you know maybe have the English horn play the bottom and the uh, just just one oboe play the top right and then and then I think it, uh, it's, just a, it's just a case with violas. Um, and I think you should also mark non divisi here, right? Because violas can play octaves. It's really no problem at all. Okay, it's, it's just a, it's a little bit more spread out than playing sixths. But yeah, it's all totally doable. All right, so arco non divisi. And then just, you know, don't do a two. Because, because it's just really soft playing right in here, right? You know what I mean? And that, that's just going to bring out the sound of the oboes, right? Which are going to be sort of somewhat harder, right? Almost more trumpet-like combined with a viola here. And that's not what you want. You want something more sensitive. You want the um, emotion of the oboe to contribute to the sensitivity of the viola, right? So don't do that with A2, Dublin. All right, just a single oboe above an English horn or clarinet below and then you've got it or even like a um, maybe a uh, bassoon could um, <clears throat> could double right the lower line okay um, right and now here like you're asking for pianissimo on a high A from your trumpet player. So that's not, that's, you know, from a regional orchestra, you're not going to get that. From a world-class orchestra, you'll get it, but it'll be sort of a little, not really strangled, but it's not going to have that same trumpet quality. Do you know what I mean? Just like the, the lovely stuff that you get from it later on. Yeah, and then here, like, you change, like, you jump up, like, dun, 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 dun right? Um, why not just keep going downhill and bringing in your your trombones? Because I just feel that that the compensation or the compromise that you make in order to, con to keep this in trumpets and horns, <clears throat> it just really interferes with the integrity of the line, right? Everywhere else, the line is going all the way down across a couple of octaves, right? But here, you jump up, right? And the jump up is so noticeable, 
Okay, I know you don't want it to be, but it just really is very noticeable. So I would say have your trombones come in if you don't feel that, that you can push the horns low enough. Okay. <clears throat> All right, and then flutes and you know, flutes and piccolo in a triple octave. Bum, 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 bum. Right, and then there's really no need for the dynamic mixing here. Just have them all be pianissimo, right? Pianissimo, horns, and uh, and trumpet. And then plucking uh, is fine. Pluck, 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 pluck. I would say start mezzo forte, go down to piano here. Okay. And now, um, bum, 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 bum with some harp here. You know what? Um, arpeggiate your harp, right? Briam, 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 briam. And, you know, in, instead of LV, just tie this to the next bar and have it be a dotted half note, right? You know, I mean, yeah, just, I, I just let, I, I'm, I'm a big fan of just like really marking how long you want the harp to last and then, and then just writing it all out. <clears throat> Yeah, and, and the harp, in order to be heard, should start at, right here, should start at mezzo forte and, you know, mezzo forte crescendo. And then you don't have to mark the, mark this, you know, you or you could mark it fortissimo if you wanted to. But, like, you really need that, you know, to come out. And and here, like, all of these, these could all be um, um, double stops. All right, and you know, because there's no need to go to. There's no need for things to be divisi, and same thing here. Arco, I would mark this divisi, just because octaves are really easy to play. Okay. Yeah. Then we've got our cascading winds. Now, <clears throat> one last thing I would just kind of point out here is: Are you really sure that you want this really? Um, divided staccato here, this really abrupt staccato. Um, uh, Lili marks mezzo staccato, right? What if you had mezzo staccato on that? Uh, give it a try. Just, you know, go to your edit version. So, because here you are implying mezzo staccato, right? And, um, yeah. Uh, so, I would say just just keep that, you know, I mean, I see, I see the point of of you having really abrupt staccatos here because you are trying to keep the keep some kind of integrity of articulation between this and the pizzicato that came before, right? Which is the the hardest, the kind of most abrupt sound of all. Anyhow, and then and then, and I just don't feel that this works, you know. Uh, I, you know, I. I don't know. I just don't know. That doesn't feel right to me. You know, um, I, I think you want this to be kind of a backgroundy kind of an effect. But what if it just was the same as this? Because you're going to get portamento anyway, because the player is going to be, they're going to have one finger down on the fundamental, and then they're going to have their little finger sitting on the node. And then they're going to slide their their hand the hand up to the next one, and then the next one, and then down, right? So if you if you're just playing this, bum 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 bum, I think it works better as, so you get a little bit of portamento anyway that just happens. So you don't even need to mark the portamento at all, right? But this, I just feel that that's really distracting. Okay, and it, I think that it's. It's the kind of thing that is going to um, use up the patience and goodwill of the of the listener, right? Um, like before, you had like these kind of ra like I, what I called raspberries, these portamentos, very free portamentos coming from the uh, from your trombones, and then some. You know, I think there was some ripping in your. Um, There's like an upward rip in the trumpets. And then we had portamento happening, you know, here and in other places and so on. <clears throat> uh, and 
and then I think it just like right at the end it just like I think the audience will just say oh man that just really got to me right all that sliding around stuff so I, I think at this point you 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 know you have I think you have you know by here right I think you have used up you, you know you you have um, cashed that check right and it's time to just like let the music be the music right but I mean kind of cool you you you're sort of using the celesta almost like a um, uh, like a glockenspiel so like if if you're working with a regional orchestra and they don't have a celesta which is quite likely in some places then you could rewrite your celesta part as a glockenspiel part right which would mean that the everything would be written down an octave in order to you know for the parts to sound two octaves higher than written now here um, I feel that you should just have one player play this like I, I mean I see what you're trying to do here you want this to sort of you want this F sharp to tie and then the other one to come in you know but I feel it's be it's just safer to leave this gesture to one player right it just you know because you don't know that the second player is any good right you do know or you can expect that the first player is good <clears throat> right and this is the most exposed place in the entire piece so you know just be aware of you know of of what you're asking right in there like the cost the possible consequences okay now one last problem here solo double bass dying away and pianissimo contrabassoon so you you're gonna have a gravelly horse and not very elegant pedal going on under this beautiful icy music right and it'll be very very noticeable even with the player playing very softly and sensitively this um, contrabassoon quality sorry this uh, screen keeps moving around uh, this contrabassoon quality is going to just be very rugged you know it's just gonna have a very rough quality compared to the you know the beautiful icy um, sparkling sound of what's above it and it's going to distract right so I would actually have it the other way around I would have your contra bassoon die out after a couple of bars and I would have two T bases right continue on and then change to pizzicato anyway I mean there's a bunch of different ways of thinking about this but yeah that would just be my impulse there and just don't don't you know there's no need for this pedal bass to go all the way to the end okay well those are my thoughts there is a lot more to unpack with this one uh, similar to some other pieces that I have evaluated recently but uh, but yeah but you know what a great score Stefano and um, you know I just really feel like the last half dozen scores or so have just really been kind of building towards the end of this very long evaluation process 146 scores um, you know wow that is just so many and you know there's of course an excitement um, sort of a feeling of an accomplishment that the um, that the community is getting bigger and more involved in everything but you know there's also kind of the cost which is uh, that it is really going to take a long time to get through all of them and that the um, the engagement of the you know, the intention span of the community is going to sort of go elsewhere by the time we get to the end of it and also it's going to make the people who done some of the hardest work on their scores have to wait the longest and uh, so I'm going to have to rethink this process a little bit I think for the next year if we keep getting over 100 scores but you know maybe we'll just go back to down to like you know 70 80 scores and that would be a lot more manageable okay well um thank you stefano i really do appreciate this it's been great uh coaching you on your scoring 
um, you know, to to have you involved with things, to you know, to have you contribute to the orchestration challenge, and uh, and and having your support on Patreon and and everything else, and just having you as a really solid member of the orchestration online community it just means a whole lot. And I just really appreciate the amount of work that you put into this. And you know, you're just to see your level of craft getting getting better and better, and you know, your understanding getting deeper and so on. That all really does mean a lot. So, uh, like I said before, try to get this performed or read or something like that. Uh, wouldn't it be great if you know if if the outcome of this was that a lot more people got to hear Lily Boulanger's music um, as interpreted by the uh, the up and coming orchestrators and composers of the world, right? Wouldn't that be a great thing? Uh, so I will leave everybody with that. Thank everybody for watching this very long video. I think this is the longest evaluation so far, but definitely one of the most complex scores with one of the most uh, things to talk about. So thanks all. Thank you very much, Stefano. And I will see you one more time in the very last evaluation of this series coming up soon.